Good, af good afternoon. I'm Walt Barron. I'd like to welcome you to the Human Development Institute's first spring seminar. We welcome the participants who are joining us online as well as the participants who are here with us at the University of Kentucky. Our presenters will provide an opportunity for questions this afternoon and we welcome questions from all of our participants. Please type your questions in the chat box if you are online. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. Please take a moment at the conclusion of the seminar to complete our brief evaluation. The evaluation will be sent to your email address after the seminar. It is really helpful as we plan for upcoming seminars. The title of the seminar is Parenting with a Disability. I'm now going to turn it over to our moderator, Jason Jones with the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute. Jason. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> uh, I'm Jason Jones. I'm from the Human Development Institute. Um, I work across three or four different projects as everyone in HDI does. Um, we've done this uh, presentation a couple times with a couple of different interchanging parts. Um, we unfortunately are down one person today, uh, Donna, who is uh, usually a member of our our team has, has gotten ill last night and not going to be able to join us today. But uh, with me today is Keith Hosey uh, on my right, and uh, Carissa Johnson is online. And I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves some in just a second after we uh, go through and do a little bit of uh, history of, of why this topic is important. Okay? Any questions to start with? And please, this is very important that this is very interactive. So if you're online or you're in the room and you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, and if you don't ask questions, I'll have to. So it'd be better if, if I didn't have to. So, all right, keep going. So the eugenics movement, um, this is uh, Carrie Buck, pictured here with her mother. Um, she was sterilized uh, by, in Virginia uh, after birth out of wedlock and she was institutionalized uh, when she became pregnant, right? So uh, the unfortunate part was probably abused by a foster parent um, and the decision by the US Supreme Court was held up and during that decision, um, one of the Supreme Court justices said um, that this was important for the good of society, that no one with a disability should be able to reproduce because we did not need another generation of imbeciles. This was Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was probably one of the more famous Supreme Court justices. Um, this is the early idea, right, that if you had a disability, you were not a fit parent and that your offspring would, in his words, probably become a criminal, okay? So this was an extreme situation. So she was the first person who was sterilized under that law. And after she was sterilized, another 8,300 Virginians underwent the same process until the 1970s, 70s, right? To me, who was born in the 70s, it doesn't seem like that long ago, um, but this was a practice that is, was honestly still on the books in a lot of states up in the 90s, although it wasn't practiced after about 1979, okay? So it was mostly repealed in 1974 in Virginia and the Supreme Court has never specifically overturned it. And more of the reason for that is because there was never another case that came to that level, right? So forced sterilization is no longer a possibility. Okay. All right. So this is some of what we talked about before. His exact quote was for the protection and the health of the state. So right in his, um, in his argument. Okay, go ahead. Instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Okay? That was not an unpopular opinion at the time. Just scary enough. Okay? So, when did forced sterilization for people with disabilities cease? I just gave you the answer. Probably should look at these slides a little closer before I start. <laughs> it is 1979. Yeah, it's actually the, yep. Okay. So another case, this is much more recent, 2009, Kenny O'Neill, a veteran and quadriplegic mother, right, who was injured while being in the military, faced an unexpected battle when her former boyfriend filed for custody of their 10-week-old son, alleging that O'Neill was not a fit and proper person, right? Not a fit and proper person to care for their son and that her disability greatly limits her ability to care for the minor 
or even wake up if the minor is distressed, okay? So he's saying she is an unfit mother because she has a physical disability. She's not going to be able to take care of this child. And he is asking for full custody, not joint custody, okay? All right, go ahead. So O'Neill demonstrated her ability to care for their son. Indeed, she had prepared her for motherhood by working with an occupational therapy program uh, for expectant mothers, adopt, adapting her house for parenting, securing adaptive baby care equipment, and using personal assistance to help her as needed, right? So if the idea is that the environment causes um, disability more than the disability itself, right? She found a way to eliminate the, the barriers of the environment, okay? So illustrating the bias that pervades the family law system, an attorney who was not affiliated with the case remarked, certainly I sympathize with the mom, but assuming both parties are equal in other respects, isn't the child obviously better off with the father? Obviously, right? Because why? Because the father can pick her up or can feed her or what exactly makes him more fit? This attorney who specialized in divorce and custody cases for more than 40 years said that O'Neill, I love this quote, would likely not be able to teach her son to write, paint, or play ball, right? Because parents are the only people that can do those things, okay? The attorney asked a news reporter, what's the effect on the child, okay? Feeling sorry for the mother and becoming the parent, okay? Pretty, pretty crazy stuff, right? So here are some facts on parenting with, this, with a disability, right? So 4.1 million parents with di have disabilities in the United States, okay? One in 10 children have a parent with a disability. So no big surprise. This is, this is kind of crazy. 35 states include disabilities as grounds for determination of parental rights, which means they can take into that in account when they determine eliminating someone's rights. And in the states at the bottom, allow physical disability as the sole ground, as the only reason for terminating parental rights. That is in Georgia, Kansas, Maryland, Mississippi, North Dakota, New Mexico, Ohio, Oklahoma, and South Carolina. To this day, those laws are still in the books. In every state, disability of the parent can be included in determining the best interest of the child. 5.6 million Americans live with paralysis and from all those different reasons, right? And two thirds of dependency statutes allow the court to determine that a parent is unfit on the basis of disability, right? And a lot of these cases too, obviously the court is not in the home, right? It's one thing for me to tell you how things are in my home, it's another thing for you to see it. They make these determinations based on anecdotal evidence. Okay, any questions? Anybody mad yet? No? Okay. We're, we, I promise to lighten it up here in a minute. I promise. You, uh, you may want to update your slide, South Carolina passed They did, that's right, you're exactly yeah. right. Yeah, I got that, that's right. South Carolina has dropped off that list. Okay, so this is my family. Uh, Micah is 11 and Bryce is eight. Micah has super long hair now. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to get him to cut it, but I, they can't hear it. Um, so they are at the funnest age ever. They're both super helpful and super awesome and, uh, and great. That's my wife, Jessica, and they're in a couple pictures too. We've been married for about 13 years now and, uh, and had kids the old fashioned way, you know, like we, we didn't adopt, we just did what we did and had children. So uh, I always say um, in the words of Obama, yes, we can, so uh, yeah. So, and I think, I think sex is something that we tend to shy away from in the disability community. Community? I'm, I'm gonna not count that as a word, how about you? No, no? okay. Yeah. In, the, in the disability community, um, sometimes it's a taboo subject where it is, should not be. It is uh, exactly acceptable and exactly as normal as it would be for any type of or any, any people on any, anywhere. So, um, yes. Pamela McIntosh online says best, the best way. Best, the best. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. The trying is the best part. Yeah. Okay. So, um, now I'm going to, we're going to go through and I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves. I think Don is next. Is Donna next or is Chris next? So Chris, if you'll take it and talk a little bit about your family and introduce yourself and take three or four minutes to, uh, tell us about your experiences. Sure. Um, this is my son, Will, he's four. And you also see in some of the pictures, my husband, Ben. Um, we, we tried the old fashioned way, but the old fashioned way just didn't work. Uh, 
and it wasn't because of my disability. That's the first question I always get. It was some other issues. Um, so we decided to foster to adopt. So we went through an agency uh, and um, set up a profile and went through all the steps to become foster parents. And then we're actually picked by a Will's birth mother um, to uh, foster to adopt him. So we took him home at birth and were foster parents for about eight months. Um, a little bit longer time than normal. A lot of that had to do with my disability and proving to the social worker that things I was doing uh, adaptively were safe and secure for the baby. But uh, he is a, he's a great kid. He is very active, loves anything to do with wheels, so I was the perfect man, right? <laughs> um, um, he's very inquisitive. Uh, I'm very involved with him. He's a great kid, so yeah. Great. Okay. And this was Donna. Donna was not able to join us today. Um, Donna is uh, one of her grandchildren is has I think stage three cancer right now, and so she's she's dealing with that. Um, but uh, Donna was a single mother for many years, and um, I wish she was here to tell her story. But Donna has a great perspective on on several issues involved parenting, and uh, we hope she can join us next time. So, Keith, you want to? I think you're next on there. And uh, I should think if you'll notice, Donna is probably uh, around five two or so. Yeah. Her sons are um, towers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, her her stories about her her sons being t teenagers and uh, you know her her trying to discipline them when they <laughs> yeah. are twice her height are pretty good. <clears throat> hey, that's me. Um, so my daughter Kayla is six years old. Um, I know uh, you can see Jason's wheelchair here, and uh, Carissa had a picture of Will in in her wheelchair. My disabilities are not as apparent all the time. Uh, I was born with club feet. I uh, had a number of surgeries. I walk with a leg brace. Um, <clears throat> I live with chronic pain. Uh, and I also have um, generalized anxiety and major depression. Uh, so those things play into some of this as well. Um, Kayla... Uh, she is awesome and my wife's in there and she is awesome too because uh, uh with her help um you know on the bad days uh, as far as pain or other things um you know we get things done okay and go ahead we have a question Kayla online says she has a great name she does <laughs> thank you kayla you do too and i, I think keith brings up a really good point um and uh, Chastity also is a member of our group and she's been sick as well. Evidently, it's not a great thing to be part of our group. So I tend to having some sickness lately, but- um, I wish you would have told me before I agreed to be I here. I know, right? Yeah, keep, keep the cell phones out today. Um, but Keith brings up a good, uh, an important point for me is that the, the um, having a spouse and having a partner in the situation obviously makes it more um, doable um, and uh, uh, Chastity did it as a single mother for a long time, and <coughs> as did Donna. Just no more. Just that was the end of it. it. Yeah. Oh, that was the end of the slideshow? That's the end of the slideshow, yeah. Oh, okay. I was confused. Yeah. yeah. We can probably keep the pictures up there. But sure. Go back. Um. You should keep flipping through them. I'm sorry. I'm kidding. Okay, so um, the first question that, um, and again, if anybody has any questions, you want to open it up for questions now, and then I'll, I'll sort of um, help sort of move that along, and we have some questions of our own if, if we don't get any from anybody out there. Anybody got any? Lindsay, welcome. It's good to see you here. Yeah. Um, have you ever been challenged by CBS or have any, have any I have not. I have not. But Donna actually has. Um, I yes. Uh, recently. Can you say that again, Car I Carissa? I have a case with CPS right now. Can you explain the situation? 
Um, the school reported possible abuse and neglect. Um, basically, thank God for me, the social worker kind of laughed at her. And once she, she saw my home and interviewed my child and myself, she, she basically said, this is not going to be open for months, but I'm not going to do anything else with it. But it was basically assumptions of the teacher. Uh, he just got put in a new preschool class this last year. So she wasn't as used to me and the way I do things, I guess. I don't really know all the specifics because I'm still going through it, but I can make assumptions. I remember some of Donna's story, if you want me to share. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. I'll talk loudly. Um, I remember when Donna shared her story for the Farm Conference, she has rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, you chair up there? Oh, so it's closer. Just stay next to me. Just talk right into the okay. triangle. Hi, my name's Lindsay Mullis. I'm a colleague of Jason Jones at HDI, um, and I was fortunate enough to hear Donna speak at the Karn Conference a um, um, couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And she has rheumatoid arthritis, which is um, what causes her small stature and her deformities. And when she was first pregnant with her first son, um, as Jason mentioned, she was a single mother, and she was told by the medical community as well um, as her family to abort the child um, just because of her disability. And she said no, um, and so, I know that that's a big part of, um, of her story was being able to advocate for herself for the first pregnancy. And then even though um, that obviously was successful, even when she got pregnant the second time, still faced those challenges. Um, so I think recognizing that that's from the medical community as well as in our social support systems as well. Right, and if you think about the idea that sterilization was all outlawed in the 70s, the idea is the same, right? The idea is that your child can't have a full and normal life with a parent who has a significant disability. So thank you for sharing. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome to come back up anytime. Just call me back. All right. uh, any other questions? So um, a question we always do is, is, Keith, can you talk a little bit about just some of the hurdles um, for you as, as being a parent? And then Carissa, uh, if you can, you can, can uh, join in after Keith. So just talk about a couple hurdles or any situations that have come about um, with you and your child and interacting with society. Sure, yeah. Um, so, my biggest hurdles are always uh, with the chronic pain. Um, you know, people talk about, uh, a lot of people in the disability community talk about uh, the spoons theory. You know, you only have so many spoons and uh, someone without a disability has way more spoons and you spend your spoons every day um, on different things. Uh, so, I, you know, before uh, we had Kayla, um, you know, I, I worried about uh, being able to keep up with having a child. Um, and it's still something that yeah, I have to pay attention to on a daily basis. Um, what I didn't know before I had her was that uh, a hug from her or something like that gave me more spoons. So, um, so that worked That's out. That's a great way to put that. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that was one concern um, prior to having her. Most of what I encounter in society um, is probably the opposite of what you and Carissa mm -hmm. encounter. Uh, when I utilize accessible things for my disabilities, uh, I, I get stares or um, people challenging my disability status, you know, because uh, the non disabled community loves to either tell us we're too disabled to do something or not disabled enough to do something. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, when Kayla was in, um, uh, you know, uh, one of those carriers uh, as an infant and I would park in an accessible space and get her out. Of course, I'd get looks. Um, you know, I, I had one person say, you know, that's for dis disabled people, not uh, because you have a baby. And um, and then, uh, you know, any time I use we went to Disney uh, after Christmas this year and I rented a scooter because it was just way too much walking for me. Um, and of course, Kayla wanted to ride in my lap and I had to tell her a number of times, this is not a toy, this is daddy's tool to get me around. Um, but, you know, going through the park, uh, if I didn't have shorts on, people couldn't see my leg brace. There were some colder days, some hotter days. Um, you know, I would get looks of, you know, 
well, why is that younger-ish? I can't say young anymore. I'm over 40, <laughs> but why is that younger-ish person riding his little kid around in that? That's, you know, I, I didn't have anyone say anything, but you always, you always see the stares sure, and the looks. For sure. Carissa, do you want to answer that question? Sure. The question was... Go ahead. Um, well, I, I, I've experienced a lot even before I was a parent because I chose the different route of adoption. Before that, we tried uh, fertility treatments and different things. And even before the fertility treatments, I went to my doctor and let her know that I was getting off the contraception. And the first thing out of that doctor's mouth was, why are you doing that? Um, and I basically gave her the obvious answer of, you know, uh, we've decided to have children. And she's, she just kind of said, do you really think that's smart? You have some difficulties. Needless to say, I switched doctors after that. Um, and during the fertility treatments, one of the things that I had to do because I was on hormones was get blood tested every uh, month along with that. And so the phlebotanist that drew my blood, I, I'm in a small rural area, so there, it's not like a bigger city. You basically go to who's available. And so we got to know each other quite well. And after month, after month, after month of uh, no success, he finally looked at me one day and he said, you know, maybe this is God's way of telling you uh, that you shouldn't be a parent for a good reason. And that's all he said, but I could tell by the look on his face, you know, he talked about you can kind of read stares and nonverbal language. I knew what he meant um, until I finished out that cycle of treatment. My husband went with me every, uh, every treatment after that because I kind of felt defeated. Um, and then in the fostering process, um, the um, social worker never really said to anything to me outright other than some of the adapt adaptive equipment I used. My brother uh, and I did some research, designed a crib for Will where the doors open up front ways. They, they kind of part the, where the bars are. Um, and they were concerned about his safety with those. Um, they were also concerned in his bassinet, we used a thicker mattress to kind of prop him up before he could roll over so that I would be able to get him as a newborn because he didn't have control of his head. Um, and she uh, proceeded to give me a big long lecture on SIDS and I shouldn't do that and I should let my husband do that and all this, that, and the other r rather than giving me a chance. So instead of the usual two visits from the social worker, I got six before he was released to be adopted. Um, since then, you know, when he was younger in the carrier, I had got stairs, obviously. I was in the doctor's office at one point. Uh, he was sick and then I was doing whatever I could to calm him down. I guess he was about two and we were singing and going on and the lady across from me says, is he yours? And I said, yes. And we were singing and going on and I heard her whisper to the lady next to her, they should never have let her do that. And the mama bear instinct, I want to react and I want to respond and I want to protect my child, but I just kept on singing. Um, and so it's things like that. One other instance, uh, I was with him in a carrier and we were going through a door and somebody asked me if I needed assistance, and I said no. And then they proceeded to take the baby carrier out of my lap. That's one time where the mama bear did come out because I touched <laughs> my child and I didn't know them from Adam. <laughs> so, yeah, we get assumptions like that a lot. So, um, so a, a good friend of mine is uh, also a quadriplegic, and him and his wife have been trying to adopt for a while, and. Um, Chris, you might be able to, to talk to this a little bit, but some of the issues they're running into is that you literally now, along with adoption, have to put together sort of a portfolio uh, mm -hmm. for parents to look at. And he said that no one basically is choosing them because he's, 
impossible for him to hide his disability in that portfolio. So did you run into any situation um, specifically with, with being able to cross over from that foster parent role no, onto the full parent with the dog? What happened to me was uh, an act of God. All I can say is because I actually met his birth mother, even though we made a portfolio, we didn't make the connection. I met her previously in our foster class. She was adopted herself. So she came to that class to kind of speak to her, uh, her experience. And then she um, got pregnant after that and decided to give the baby up for adoption. So that was my fear uh, because that's what you read in the statistics in the news that you're not gonna get picked. I went round and round with the, the people at the adoption agency about that because I had some sleepless nights over that, but lucky for me, that didn't happen. Great. Yeah. So that is a, that is a significant issue um, when, when biological children aren't an option uh, for people with disabilities, then they want to enter into that adoption um, realm and, and foreign adoption is getting almost impossible um, in those situations unless you're going to adopt a child with a disability too. So, all right, any questions? Yes. Maya online asks, what as a parent have you found the most difficult thing and the easiest thing to do? I, I will address that as loving your kids is the easiest thing to do and, and the hardest sometimes, <laughs> um, uh, depending on, yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's, that's universal for all parents, it has nothing to do with disabilities. Um, the, the most difficult things for me, and I want everybody on the panel to address this, but most difficult things for me was um, when I got married, my wife was very adamant about the fact, I'm sorry, before we got married, the conversation revolved a lot around, can we have children? And that was before we took that step into marriage. And, uh, and her family put a little bit of pressure on her in the same way, like that you've always wanted to be a mother. Is he going to be able to do that? You know, just, it was just a lack of knowledge more than anything else. And, um, and so I proved to all of them that I could, no, I'm just kidding. I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, um, but once, once that was, we got past that hurdle, everything was, was much better. But the difficult things for me were, I grew up with a really close father who, you know, hit baseballs to me in the backyard and coached my team sometimes. And, um, was very involved um, to a great point, not over-involved, like I guess some parents can be, but um, he was always really there for us in every situation. And I just remember a couple of times in life, just him coming by and sort of just squeezing my shoulder and that making everything just okay. You know, I was, I had that kind of dad. Still have that kind of dad. Um, talk about him like in the past tense, but, um, and those were the things that are, were difficult for me and continue to be. Um, I will say that, um, that did not outweigh the idea of not having children, right? So uh, for me, the natural progression of things were, you know, get a college degree, get married, have children, you know, find a good job, whatever, in whatever order that goes. Um, and I consider myself complete at this point because of doing those things. Um, but we still struggle with that a little bit. Um, I, uh, I want to hug my kids. And, um, you know, when they get hurt, it's really hard. That's probably when it's the most difficult on those days when you just can't physically interact um, like you can. And sometimes they don't get to do things. Uh, my, my disability can be pretty severe sometimes um, as far as not being able to get out and stuff. I, it's pretty rare, but that stuff does happen, usually at the most inopportune times, unfortunately. Um, so that's probably the most difficult. But um, being a parent is the hardest job in the world anyway, right? I mean, everybody with kids knows that. Um, and, uh, so it's difficult enough without the disability, but, uh, loving, loving my kids has never been an issue. So Keith, you want to best and the worst, uh, well, most difficult, least difficult. So, um, I, I would say the least difficult, uh, is, is, you know, loving her, of course, um, and being as much a part of her life as I can, um, the most difficult for me uh, is is worrying about missing out on things because of my disabilities. Um, so, I, you know, I may not go to some field trip or some thing on the weekend uh, because it's um, I'm having high pain or because I know it's going to be a lot of walking and I don't have a lot of options. Um, so there, I mean, there have been times where I have chosen not to participate in that activity. Uh, her and her mom uh, 
will go do it or she'll do it with friends. Um, so, uh, you know, like the zoo is one of those things, uh, the Louisville Zoo where we live. There's, it's a lot of walking. Um, they have polar bears though now, right? They have sloths now. <laughs> okay. We haven't okay. seen the sloths yet. Yeah. Um, so there, there have been times and then, you know, she comes home and she's so excited to tell me about, we saw this and the polar bear was doing this. And so, I, you know, I, I feel not that great when that stuff happens. Mm -hmm. I'm happy she had that experience. Um, and then, uh, you know, my anxiety, the way it manifests uh, when I have an anxiety attack, I'm pretty much out all day. My body goes out of whack. My anxiety attacks are full body, um, like limbs go numb. And sometimes I lose uh, my ability to say words that make sense. Um, luckily, I'm on a great medicine and that doesn't happen. Uh, hasn't happened in a long time, um, but the, it's, it's there. Sometimes I'll get migraines um, from the anxiety. And so, uh, you know, I, I'll miss a day if that happens. That doesn't happen very often either, thankfully, but um, it has happened where I'm just out of commission in the bed. Uh, and and I, would, I think, um, and Chris, I'll, I'll let you answer this question in a second. I, I would say also, um, um, Keith may agree with this, that our kids are super, super resilient. Um, and I was supposed to put that on me but, when I was talking. It, it's better. It's good. Um, but, but kids are really resilient. And um, I, I don't, it, my, I guess the fear that my kids are noticing that they're missing out on something is more of a fear than is probably reality um, a lot of the times. So, um, so I think it's important to remember that. And, 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 and right now, before we go any further, listen, this is the coolest thing in the world, having children. And having a disability has got nothing to do with that one way or the other. So I think we tend to, you know, we start with eugenics and we start with forced sterilization, these big heavy things and how difficult it can be and how our disability gets in the way. But this is, but I am very happy in my life and I'm very happy with my children. And, and it's far more, um, far more exciting than it is detrimental most of the time. So. And uh, before we go to Carissa, I just want to follow up on that and, and uh, say, you know, I was really lucky um, before we had Kayla of knowing a number of parents who had yes, disabilities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so that helped me shape my thinking that, well, yeah, I, you know, there may be barriers and there may be unique things that come up because of my disabilities, but um, I can do it. I, I know other people that are doing it with various types of disabilities. Um, so surely I can figure it out. And I'm sure now too, like at first for me and Jess, for sure, like it's almost a blessing when someone asks a question, especially if someone has a disability and they're looking to move into that next, you know, season of their life. And, and, it, and it's different. You know, I mean, we all know, you know, the day after, the day before you have a child is way different than the day after. It's, it's a whole new world. And, uh, and it, having that mentorship role has always been significantly beneficial. So, so Kristen, you want to talk a little bit about um, the, the, the good, the good things and, and, and possibly the tough things that you've dealt with? The good things. Well, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth as far as good. The easiest thing is loving him. Uh, he's probably my best friend, and my husband knows I say that. <laughs> um, the other day, he told me, I want to watch a craft video with you, Mama. And I'm like, yes, my life is complete. Uh, so he... He's just my little sidekick. He's my little helper. That's what makes that so easy. Um, the most difficult thing, again, you keep the words right out of my mouth. I, the last fall, he wanted to go in a pumpkin patch. Well, that pumpkin patch isn't the most wheelchair accessible thing in the world. So no, they are not. He, did it. Uh, he wanted to do a maze. Well, that corn maze wasn't the most accessible thing in the world. Him and his daddy did it. Uh, I have uh, days of pain too, and spasms and things like that so there's a lot of times where him and his dad go do stuff and he comes home like he said really excited about what he saw or that fire truck he went on or whatever and you know i thought dang you know i want to do that too but for the most part we make mommy and will time and that makes it a little easier and mommy and will time may look a little different than daddy and will time but he's getting the best of both worlds and that's what i have to remind myself 
That's great, and that, that brings that's a, that's a good point about um, mommy and real time. That that's that's one thing that that was a struggle when my kids were younger. And I remember saying to my wife at some point, like, like I wish I could just, you know, are they ever going to be able to, you know, sit in my lap? You know, like the interaction was difficult because during the baby phase, mom did all the work, right? I mean, mom did all the diapers, mom did all the late night feedings, mom did all those things, and as and that's a bit emasculating. It was for me because again, my dad was very hands on, um, so that was that was probably a difficult thing. But it's so amazing how we've seen that transition now to where, um, and and I'm sure you're seeing this with Caleb being seven now, that they're so freaking helpful. Yeah. You know, I mean, we we had a hotel room now, and where you know we we drag half the house with us when we go somewhere, and we hit the hotel room now, and the kids are pulling stuff out of bags and putting them in drawers, and they know my lift goes a certain place, and they hang the chains on there, and they push the bed over, and like you know, like this was. You know, two years ago, it was still a super difficult situation. And as the kids have aged, they've become more and more of a help in it, which is, which is pretty amazing. So um, that, that's great. So I want to go back a little bit to what Keith said, and I think Carissa alluded to this as well, about being able to um, participate fully. And, and Lee Gordon is another quadriplegic that um, is part of this group as well. And uh, Lee always talks about the importance of being there when you can, not for your child, um, of course for your child, but also for society. And so um, he talks a lot about um, things that I run into all the time is that we end up being the host of everything because our house is accessible. And so um, it's difficult when there are things like team awards or, or just random practices that jump up or parties, birthday parties are always an issue when they're at somebody's <clears throat> house, those kinds of things. So um, have you all ever ran into those situations and how important is it do you all think um to to be there as often as you can just so people because the cool thing you see is that um when my kids are involved the parents of the other kids are now to the point where they go this needs to be accessible we got to make sure jason can come as well which has been a very nice derivative of of um, being able to be in, interacting with those parent groups so chrissy you want to take that yeah um... i'm not sure there's a question there but Go ahead. I kind of have <laughs> taken my disability as cerebral palsy, so I've had it all my life, and I've always been brought up in that role of teacher, whether I want to be or not. So um, I want to be the one to prove before you even ask me the question. That's just my personality. So I'm at I'm at every uh, field trip, barring the farm this year. I could not go to the farm because it was muddy. Uh, I'm at every game. I'm at. I'm in the dugout at T-ball. I'm at everything that I can possibly be at. Why? Because you know, it is being there for my child, but it's also letting people know that I can do it before they're even questioning. Because a lot of the questions I got in the beginning, or you know, is your husband here? You know that kind of thing. And I don't like those questions. I can do these these things myself. So. Um, one of the things that Will really liked when he was really small was, the, and still to this day, was the playground. And the playground was a difficult thing for me. Uh, I'm fortunate enough in my line of work at a disability resource center that I could tie that back into work. And we developed a disability-friendly playground where I'm actually able to push him on the swing or do the accessible monkey bars or the merry-go-round where I couldn't be. So I kind of take it along as a little to heart as it's my job to change those attitudes. Um, so things are a little bit easier for his generation and the generations after. Great. Yeah. Keith, do you have any? Yeah, it's kind of hard to follow someone who made an entire playground accessible. That is difficult. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Overachiever. We're still working on it. <laughs> It's a next level parenting with a disability. Um, 